from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. AARP West Virginia, your ally for real possibilities in the Mountain State. Online at aarp.org slash wv. West Virginia University. Online at wvu.edu. At the legislature today, delegates debate a bill that would get rid of the state's courtesy patrol, saving just $5 million in the state budget. In the Senate, members vote to grant more freedoms to higher education institutions in hiring and layoffs. And how much will budget reductions impact the health insurance coverage of public employees? We ask the two men overseeing the program coming up on the legislature today. I'm Ashton Mara. The budget remains the top priority for Republican legislative leaders who released their 2018 framework yesterday. Their budget plan will hold spending, they say. The only, excuse me, will hold spending only to the revenues the state is expected to bring in next year, just over $4 billion. But that budget likely won't leave room for any growth, especially in areas where growth is sometimes unavoidable, like health care. Joining me tonight to discuss the issue are Secretary of the Department of Administration, John Myers. He was appointed to the position earlier this year by Governor Jim Justice. And Ted Cheatham, he's the Director of the Public Employees Health Insurance Agency. Gentlemen, thanks so much for being here this evening. Thank you for having us. Right off the top, we have to disclose that I am a public employee and therefore am covered by PEIA. But Ted, let's start with you. Last I heard, there is no intention to increase funding for PEIA in this year's budget. So what does that mean for public? employees. So our board went out to public hearings in November and made a plan to meet the budget needs that we have in place. So you're going to see additional deductibles, additional out-of-pocket maximums, some changes to some co-pays, some fixed base facility fees, uh, all to the employees. And Secretary, mm -hmm. this is an ongoing problem. This lack of funding is not going to just go away, correct? That's true, Ashton. This is one of the issues and a, a good example of one of the things that needs to be dealt with by the legislature. This is a budget issue, it seems like, every year that we need to take care of and not, as the governor says, kick the can down the road. So how can lawmakers do that? I recognize it's difficult in your position to go to, to uh, give lawmakers a directive, let's say. But if you were to advise them on how to fix this shortfall and sure up PEIA, how, how would you propose they do that? Well, I think the governor's given some good advice as ways that we could accomplish this. But thinking about it, you know, creating jobs is a way that we can minimize or stabilize those premiums because everybody shares in the fixed cost of this <coughs> benefit that we receive, that that cost is reduced by having more people in the plan. So Ted, we often talk about the 80-20 model. And it's a kind of a difficult yes. thing. If you can explain, can you explain that 80-20 model to us? What does that mean for sure. funding? Sure. The PEIA statute requires that the employer pay 80% of the premiums for active employees, state employees, and that the employees contribute 20% of their share in aggregate. That's what the 80-20 rule So we often hear at the legislature, though, you know, this year they don't intend to increase funding, which means higher costs for PEIA, people who are covered yeah. by mm -hmm. PEIA. But if they did increase funding, there would be increased payments for PEIA, cover, excuse me, people who are covered by PEIA. Absolutely. Can you explain that? Sure. So let's say they raised it by $100. They gave us $100. Well, they would pay 80 of the 100 and the employees would have to pay 20 of the 100 to stay at that 80-20 match for the $100. So then how, do, how does the funding impact retirees who are covered under the insurance? So, uh, you know, it's a very complicated process at PEIA, as, they've <laughs> as many people have said. Uh, the retirees are subsidized by active employees by about 70%. So 70% of current year retiree premium is subsidized by the active employees. So anything we do to the active employee plan directly affects that subsidy to the retirees. 
Now, PEIA has been working on some cost-saving measures. Can, can we go over what those are? Sure, we're, we're looking at new ideas every time, we're all about having something available for people. Probably the biggest one that's coming uh, uh, in April 1st is called RX Savings, and we're gonna look at the drug prescriptions of everybody out there and see if we can find a way to get them on a more effective and cheaper drug, get them off those brand drugs, move them to generics, and give them the information they need to be able to make those changes. Uh, we, we launched about two weeks ago, I Select MD, which is a telemedicine company that will take calls 24 hours a day that you can call if you need services to avoid urgent care or emergency room visits. So that's good. And then, of course, we did those facility-based maximum fees outside the state of West Virginia. Now, PEIA has also put into place a, a program to encourage public employees to be healthier. Are we seeing any savings from that program just yet? Uh, yes and no. We have several programs, including a diabetic face-to-face -face program, a weight management program, and our Healthy Tomorrow's program, which you were talking about. If people are engaged, what we've learned of all these programs, if they're engaged, the programs work, and they work well. The people that are not engaged, we don't see any savings at all. So the Healthy Tomorrow's is know your numbers and do something about them. Work with your physician to get your, your biometric numbers in, in shape. Last year, we ran into a position where we didn't have a budget in place and it was time for open enrollment. And PEIA went through with open enrollment. The budget came through and that made changes to the plans that PEIA was able to offer. And you had to go through that process all over again. Is there any worry that that could happen again? And how are you all preparing for it? Oh, there's always a worry. And it's very difficult to prepare for that. Uh, our open enrollment starts April 1st. Session this year, because it's delayed, uh, we'll, we'll still be in session when we go. And we do have a somewhat of a cutoff by July 1st because we have IRS requirements with our flexible spending accounts and our, our other accounts. So how do you prepare? Is there anything you can do in case they don't meet that July 1st deadline? We, we react quickly. Mm -hmm. That's the best we can do. Mm -hmm. Now I understand there was a bill that was introduced into the Senate that since gone away, but the idea was to privatize, excuse me, to dissolve PEIA and to place that into the private sector. The House Speaker has pushed this idea of privatization across government services. Secretary, can we start with you? Is privatizing PEIA the right thing for state government? Well, I think, um, and Ted probably knows this better than I do, but there, in a sense, it's already privatized, and I think mm -hmm. we've we've had this discussion with the legislature, and we've tried to communicate that across to them how it already fits into that model. So maybe Ted probably can give you more detail, but yeah. Uh, so at, so at its core, we're 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 a fifty-person agency, uh, and we pretty much privatize most things. All of our claim payments, our pharmacy benefit management, we use a Medicare Advantage plan. We're pretty much manage contracts and do minimal services to support the state of West Virginia. I mean, we want to keep a call center so that if you have a complaint about any of our vendors or need assistance that can't be provided externally, we, we want people at the plan talking to you. Ted Cheatham, Director of PEIA and Secretary John Myers, thank you both so much for joining me. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Delegates today took on a bill eliminating the state's courtesy patrol. It's an issue that's been debated several times at the State House over the past few years as a way to cut government spending. Liz McCormick reports. The West Virginia Courtesy Patrol is a state-funded roadside assistance service. But as members in the House continue to look for places to cut to balance the 2018 budget, delegates have set their sights on the program's $5 million budget. The Courtesy Patrol has been around for almost 20 years. It's a nonprofit of the Citizens Conservation Corps through a contract with the West Virginia Division of Highways. The patrol was initially set up as a way to help curb unemployment. To date, the patrol has received over 3 million calls and employs nearly 100 people. House Bill 2007 eliminates the patrol programs and transfers its funding to the state road fund. Although the patrol travels roadways across West Virginia, it's headquartered in Democratic delegate Ed Evans' district. He spoke in opposition to the bill and argues he didn't get elected to get rid of jobs. Mr. Speaker, job creation, job retention, and earning potential is what we should be about. This program is going to kill 90 jobs. 90. That's drivers. That's the people that actually do the repair work, change those tires for you on the side of the road, whatever it might be. 
Republican Delegate John Kelly of Wood County also spoke against the bill. He shared a personal story when the courtesy patrol helped him and his wife after a tire blew out on his car. It was uh, pretty refreshing when that, uh, when that white truck and the yellow lights pulled up behind my vehicle. And that individual sat there until we were able to get someone there to change a tire on that vehicle. Uh, it was extremely uh, gratifying to my wife because she was scared to death. However, Delegate Danny Hamrick, a Republican from Harrison County, spoke in favor of the bill, pointing out that there are other programs in the private sector that can provide the same service. Just noting, looking at my uh, car insurance, Bill, I note that I, I pay approximately $3 a month to have a roadside assistance survey or service um, provided uh, to do the same things. So that is, it is available through many different avenues to the citizens of our state. Republican Delegate Marty Gearhart of Mercer County is the lead sponsor of the bill and the chairman of the House's Roads and Transportation Committee. He says he doesn't discount anything the Courtesy Patrol has done in the past, but he says it's not the government's role to provide roadside assistance. He also points out in this tight budget year, lawmakers have to be looking at hard cuts. So we're looking at somewhere between 4 and $5.5 million that can be used to improve, maintain, repair the roads that we have here in the state of West Virginia, which I do consider to be within our role of state government, and that does in fact employ West Virginians that are engaged in that endeavor. House Bill 2007 passed on a close vote, 58 to 41, and now goes to the Senate for consideration. For the legislature today, I'm Liz McCormick in the House. A Senate committee is also looking for ways to increase funding for road construction and maintenance. Although the courtesy patrol bill would reduce spending, senators are supporting increasing taxes and fees for new revenue. The proposal presented to committee members today has been in the works for several years and has taken several forms, but this year appears to have bipartisan support. Members of the Transportation Committee were presented with Senate Bill 477 this morning, a bill that would create nearly $34 million in additional revenue each year for road and bridge maintenance and construction. The bill was presented to lawmakers by Governor Jim Justice near the start of the legislative session, but in a press conference shortly after, Justice announced he had changed his budget plan and reduced the tax increases included in the bill. Senate Bill 477, as presented to lawmakers today, would raise fees at the Division of Motor Vehicles starting in July of this year. Some of those fees, which haven't been increased in decades, would go up by just a few dollars. Others, like the annual vehicle registration fee, would increase by about $30. The rates would then be tied to the National Consumer Price Index and automatically increase every five years for inflation. Senate Bill 477 also proposes increasing the gasoline tax by four and a half cents. Almost immediately, Democratic Senator Bob Beach spoke in favor of the proposal. I, I'm very much in favor of this piece of legislation. I'm anxious to see this uh, out in the communities, and I'm sure our residents would as well. It was clear, however, that some lobbying interests did not agree with Beach's support. Louis Southworth, who represents GoMart convenience stores in West Virginia, says the increased gasoline tax will only hurt retailers in border counties. On the way to the Capitol this morning, uh, I suspect each of you, uh, or at least you will on your way home, uh, saw a sign that said gasoline in Charleston, $2.29. It's the only product that we all see every day as we drive past. The problem is that people that live in our border areas see these every day. And every day as they travel in and out of West Virginia, Southworth says they see the cheaper prices in Virginia or Maryland or Ohio, and they buy their gasoline out of state. Republican Senator Patricia Rucker from Jefferson County said that is her reality in the eastern panhandle. To fill up my gas tank in West Virginia is already costing me a lot more. Um, I have a 20-gallon tank. I drive a minivan with, for my five children. It's $45 right now to fill up. I can go drive literally two and a half miles to the nearest gas station in Virginia and save myself about 35 cents per gallon. And yes, I will do that every chance I get. 
Mike Clouser represents the West Virginia Contractors Association, who would benefit from the bill. A higher gas tax and increased DMV fees means more money for road maintenance and construction projects, which would put Clouser's contractors and construction workers to work. On average, Clouser says the increased cost to West Virginians is not all that high compared to the benefits they would receive. All of those, all of those fees in that uh, that you have before you in, in Senate Bill 477, it totals about $90 a year. That is less than 25 cents a day in what it costs the average West Virginian. Republican Senator Ed Gonch says he struggled with trying to find another way to fund the state's road system, something other than increasing taxes and fees, but he hasn't been able to find one. That's why he's supporting the governor's proposal. Uh, we have, I forgot what uh, Mr. Clouser said, the uh, sixth largest highway system in the, in the country for a state as small as we are. And we have done nothing, nothing to improve the funding to fix them, and the results speak for themselves. Uh, not only are we the fifth worst when it comes to bridges, but I'm starting to see weight limits put on bridges. That's going to have an impact. Uh, who wants to move here? Who wants to do business here if they can't run their trucks over our bridges? I mean, to me, this is a no-brainer. This, this, is, this is the ultimate idea of putting one's head in the sand. Gonch calls Senate Bill 477 a jobs bill and a driver for economic development. His fellow committee members, with the exception of Rucker, joined him in his support for the bill and now goes to the Senate's Finance Committee for further consideration. On the floor today, senators approved a bill to give some higher education institutions more flexibility in how they hire and fire employees in the wake of potentially deeper budget cuts. Yesterday, when Republican legislative leaders presented a framework for their 2018 budget bill, Senate President Mitch Carmichael said higher ed will face significant reductions again this year. Senators also voted to amend a bill today they hope will bring economic growth to the state, but those changes had members crossing party lines in the name of protecting their districts. Senate Bill 28 would put in code a process any three neighboring counties could adopt to create an off-road trail system for recreational use. These trail systems would be similar to the Hatfield-McCoy Trail in southern West Virginia, located in Kanawha, Lincoln, Wayne, Boone, Logan, Mingo, Wyoming, McDowell, and Mercer counties. Boone County Democratic Senator Ron Stallings moved to amend the bill today, though, limiting the state to just two additional regional recreational authorities or trail systems until July of 2022. In effect, it would be a pilot program to see what impact the uh, new trails in different parts of the state would have uh, on uh, existing trails. He was joined in his amendment by the bill's lead sponsor, Upshur County Republican Senator Robert Carnes. But Majority Leader Ryan Ferns from Ohio County says the bill is about expanding economic opportunities for all regions of West Virginia. I think West Virginia is in a position where we can't uh, regulate any opportunities out of existence. I mean, uh, th this has been a, a great attraction. We're always trying to find ways to increase tourism in our state. Um, this has been successful in southern West Virginia. And I think, you know, as, as my friend um, uh, had already commented, um, the greater the trail system, the greater potential for attracting people, not just from within West Virginia to utilize the trail system, but from states all over the country. He defended his position when questioned by Cabell County Democratic Senator Mike Woeful. Have you been to Mingo County lately? Uh, not in the last year, I'll say. Okay, have you been to Logan County lately? I haven't been to any of those counties in the last year. With all due respect, those places are like a war zone, and they have very little in terms of economic development. In, in fact, recently, Logan County just lost well over 100 jobs at the Buck Harless uh, Center, really good paying jobs, well paying jobs. So I don't know. I mean, I appreciate the free market and all that, but would you agree with me that times are much harder in that part of the state than they are where you're from? Without question, and that's why I started off my comments by saying I understand the rationale, my, my friend from Boone, the argument that he was making. 
Um, I, I don't have the same fear that he does that having trails elsewhere in the state is going to be harmful. I think it has the potential to bring in even more people. The amendment only allowing two more regions to expand trail systems across county lines was adopted after senators were asked to stand to show their support or disapproval of the change. The bill will be put to a final vote in the Senate tomorrow. During the 2015 legislative session, lawmakers approved a plan to reintroduce elk into the state. It took almost two years for that plan to come to fruition, but in December, former Governor Earl Ray Tomlin celebrated the release of a small population into southern West Virginia. As Clark Davis reports, the release was just the first step in a plan the former governor and lawmakers alike hope will boost economic development in the region. You, uh, you don't ne necessarily think of elk as something that draws a big crowd, but, you know, it's a historic day. With that, West Virginia's 35th governor, O. Ray Tomlin, reintroduced a population of elk in the state after more than 140 years. The 24 elk were released on top of a reclaimed mine site on the border of Logan and Mingo counties. This is just the first of several carefully planned releases designed to establish self-sustaining and viable populations in the Mountain State. In 2015, legislation authorized the Division of Natural Resources to begin an active elk restoration plan, starting with finding enough suitable land to sustain a population. Through a partnership with the Conservation Fund, the agency acquired more than 32,000 acres of publicly accessible land and another 10,000 through lease agreements. The elk were sourced from a national recreation area in western Kentucky and brought to the Tomlin Wildlife Management Area. Initially fenced in, DNR officers gave the elk some time to settle before they were released and able to roam the acreage freely. To think we're going to have elk running these hills and hollows is something really special for all of us, whether you're a hunter or somebody just loves these majestic creatures. Congressman Evan Jenkins attended the December ceremony marking the release. He, like the other politicians in attendance, believes the new population will do more than just enhance the state's natural beauty. And I think, yeah, having these uh, elk uh, herd back in West Virginia is something positive for southern West Virginia. It'll bring uh, tourists in, hopefully cause a little bit of an uptick in our economy in southern West Virginia. Tomlin says the reintroduction of the species will help diversify the economy of the region. In nearby Kentucky, they began reintroducing the animals in the late 90s. And since, the population has grown exponentially, with more than 10,000 elk living in a 15-county area in eastern Kentucky. In those areas, wildlife tours are provided and restaurants and shops have popped up to support the industry. And then there's the potential for hunting. In Kentucky, hunters enter a lottery for permits to pursue the prized animals. DNR Director Bob Falla estimates it could be 10 years before West Virginia's herd is large enough to allow for hunting but it's still part of the reintroduction plan. State wildlife officials spent an estimated 250000 on the effort, most of which came from the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, a Montana-based conservation group dedicated to helping grow the species. The DNR will buy more than 40,000 acres being used for the program in phases, using money from state taxes on hunting equipment, as well as grant money. The state has received a $250,000 grant from the Walmart Acres for America program and a $250,000 grant from the Knobloch Family Foundation. Still, Fallis says the elk restoration program is the taxpayers. This is your day. Every time you buy a hunting or a fishing license or a stamp or a, a box of shelves, you pay for all this. So this is, this is, this is your day and you've made it all possible. The DNR hopes that as the female elk give birth to calves, the population will expand and eventually take hold in Logan, McDowell, Mingo, Wyoming, Boone, Lincoln, and Wayne counties. The progress of the herd and their migration throughout the state and potentially into neighbor states will be tracked through electronic animal tags already placed on the animals. West Virginia's elk restoration program is part of a larger project happening in Kentucky but also Virginia, helping the species grow in the Appalachian region. For the legislature today, I'm Clark Davis in Logan County. Thanks to the governor's office and Kentucky Field TV for contributing to that report.
Next week marks nine months since communities in south central West Virginia experienced severe flooding that took the lives of 23 West Virginians. Tomorrow we check in on one of the hardest hit of those communities, Richwood. Mayor Bob Henry Babel Baber will join us to discuss the federal and state aid his town has received, the rebuilding process, and the potential closures of schools at the heart of his community. And remember, you can watch the legislature at work live every day on the West Virginia channel. Tune in at 11 a.m. to watch the House and Senate floor sessions or catch them as they're rebroadcast each evening at 7. Those are also available streaming online at wbpublic.org. This has been the Legislature Today. I'm Ashton Mara. Thanks for joining us. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. AARP West Virginia, your ally for real possibilities in the Mountain State. Online at aarp.org slash wv. West Virginia University. Online at wvu.edu. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting.